Now, my first guest today is seen as one of Nigeria's most celebrated print journalists, a compelling writer and newspaper columnist, and a committed news activist who's written some of the most thought-provoking accounts of Nigerian politics. He is, of course, Simon Kolawole, a journalist who spends time weaving together analysis of what might be the political and economic fate of this country and its citizens. And now, with the elections just spitting distance away, his writing is at the forefront of the hustings and the key political battlegrounds as he uses his very demanding scratch to ponder how to save this country from a deepening crisis involving insecurity, ethnic divisions, economic meltdown, a cost of living squeeze, public dissatisfaction and a growing sense of helplessness, hopelessness but also of hope. But even as he assesses the failure of past and present governments, he also asks pointedly whether any new administration will do any better. And he is, of course, perfectly positioned to ask those questions, having held the job of editor of this day newspaper for five years and is today the founder and chief executive officer of Cable Newspaper Limited, publisher of The Cable, Nigeria's independent online newspaper. And I'm absolutely thrilled to bits to say that Simon Kolawole joins me now in the studio. <laughs> You're looking at me like, surely he's not talking about me, is he? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for yeah. coming in. Great to see you. Yeah. Let's start with your extensive journalistic career, in the course of which you've seen an enormous transformation in the politics and evolution of this country, from military to civil rule, then to a presidential incumbent being voted out, and now in 2023, a four-way race for the presidency, with each candidate coming from a different geopolitical zone and from three different ethnic groups, because two of them are from one ethnic group. Do you think that that evolution has been for the better or for the worse? Yeah, thanks for that question because it's something that people have been discussing generally. Um, I will tell you something. What I can see is progress. I see parallels being drawn between 1979 and now, uh, First Republic and now. But if you look at it, the major presidential candidates, they have cross-regional appeal. They have cross-cultural appeal compared to what we used to have in the past. Uh, in 1979, for instance, Chief of Bafe Miawolo's UPN was limited mm. to, the, to the, Western, uh, the old Western region. Uh, Dr. Nam the Azikiwe's uh, MPP was basically the Eastern uh, region, uh, well, the former Eastern region, mm. and we, where he had allies in Plateau State, where he also won. And um, uh, uh, the MPN was also uh, largely in the North, even though they had allies in the uh, uh, minority area of the South. Uh, if you look at the current uh, front runners, mm. they have cross cultural appeal, whether it is APC, whether it is the Labour Party. And at the PDP. very least, they're making the effort and to cultivate that cross cultural exactly. appeal. Exactly. So gradually, you are seeing that people are realizing that look, if I want to be president of this country, if I want to lead this country, mm. I cannot just sit back in my region hoping that my people alone can make me president. Uh, the PDP, for instance, has a Northern presidential candidate mm. and has a very strong uh, 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 foothold in, in southern states. Mm. Uh, the same thing with APC, a southern presidential candidate. And uh, the Labour Party mm. is not just about where the candidate comes from, uh, in places outside uh, his region. So I, I am seeing progress, maybe not at the level mm. that we wanted, maybe not at the speed that we wanted, but certainly this is not the Nigeria of 1979 or 1983. This is not even the Nigeria of 1999. Yeah, well, that stepping forward. That's a good premise to set out. And, and of course, beyond that, I mean, you've watched this country racing towards the 2023 presidential election, a ballot that many believe will be the closest since 1999 in terms of the, the fight between the, the front-runner candidates. What's the big picture that you see on the road to that election beyond what you just described? 
Um, there is something that has been happening in recent times that I like. In 2011, well, 2010, when uh, President Omar uh, uh, Musa Aradwa was ill, mm. there were questions about this is not how a country should run. The president was uh, sick to death. He didn't transfer power. And then we started having civil society organizations. We started having movements coming up. I said, this is not how a country should be. I, I remember there was a group called Save Nigeria. Mm. And I think something started then, which is when you look back. That's how history works. While you are part of history, you really don't realize what is happening. Something mm. happened. That was the first time that there was something like a movement in Nigeria about how a president, uh, about the election of a president. And in 2011, you have people saying, oh, we are not voting for PDP. We are voting for good luck, Jonathan. PDP is bad, but they have a good candidate. Um, we are voting for a breath of fresh air. Mm. I remember properly. Uh, by 2015, people say, oh, Jonathan, you didn't deliver. You couldn't handle Boko Haram. You couldn't handle corruption. You couldn't do this. And people started saying, change. Mm. There was a movement. There was a wind across the country. Change, change, change. And, well, not basically the youth, still the old order and a mixture of the youth, but now we are having the youth saying, no, we want a different country. So I am seeing a, uh, some progressive movement along that line. Mm. And that is about the power of the people. I think people are more... Uh, they, they, are, they are more politically aware. Mm. And they are thinking, oh, go and get your PVC and vote. If you are complaining somewhere, say, do you have a PVC? Go and get your PVC and vote. It's, it's a good journey. Of, uh, it's a good forward journey. Yes, I, I think um, quite a few people would concur with that assessment. But be, beyond that, I mean, have you seen the last few years of the past administration? as being good or bad for Nigerian politics in your assessment? I mean, it may not be that black and white. There may be a gray area, but that's for you to tell us what your assessment is. Because a lot of people seem to have this deeply cynical feeling that the politicians and the institutions are speaking less for them now than ever before. And that both the politicians and the institutions are largely corrupt, which has been, if you like, historical corruption in this country. And that this country is heading towards an economic crisis and a crisis of democracy unless it is rescued in 2023. Yeah, um, politicians must come up with slogans for every election, whether it is hope, whether it is reclaim Nigeria, uh, recover Nigeria. Mm. Um, the Nigeria that I have observed for quite a long time, um, from when I was a teenager till now, I, I always see that tendency to say, oh, things are so bad. This is the worst this country has ever been. And so progressively, this is funny, uh, I was discussing with my father-in-law one day, and he said, do you realize that every progressive president is always rated as worse than the previous one? Oh, even Obasanjo was not this bad. Oh, even Aradua was not this bad. Even Jonathan was not this bad. So, But are the people just casting their leaders in a bad light? Or are they living through some pretty dreadful times? Because, I mean, broadly assessing things, yeah. it does seem as if things get worse, not better. Yeah, that is one way of looking at it. Mm. It depends on what you are looking at. Some things actually get better on that... Uh, some presidents and some things get worse. Uh, Obasanjo came in, he was abused for the eight years. It was when he left, people now say, Oh, this man did this, this man did this, this man did that. If you take the newspapers from 1999 to 2007, it was not all praise for Obasanjo. Mm. But, oh, this man licensed telecoms companies. Oh, this has created a new economy. When we were abusing Obasanjo, the people always told us, but he did GSM. I said, okay, GSM, the auction license, what else? We need electricity. And then he started the power project. It was much later. Mm. Now, what am I saying? It's not black or white. There is no way every president we have had, they, are, they have taken certain steps that have been progress. And they have also done certain things that uh, were not much of a progress. Other Jonathan, for instance, who was widely criticized, he, he started rail projects. 
that President Buhari completed, didn't abandon. Jonathan also did a lot in agri in the area of rice, cassava. He did a lot in that. And President Buhari came and built on that. Mm. So what, what happens basically is that when you are going through pains, the tendency to even think that this is the worst possible is always there. But if you reflect, uh, this afternoon I was driving through Abuja and somebody was saying, oh, do you remember Emma Plaza? It was bombed by Boko Haram in 2014 or so. Mm. And I said, oh, when was the last time Boko Haram bombed Abuja? It could also get worse that you are here and you are scared that on my way home I could be bombed. Of course, Boko Haram, we couldn't continue it in, uh, in uh, Boronos, in the Northeast for so long. But from what I'm hearing, from what I'm seeing, I think it's been contained gradually. But not the level that I want to wake up in the morning and realize that there's no Boko and say that there's no Boko Haram anymore. Yeah, of course, some things have got worse. The security situation mm. has become worse in several parts of the country. Still, there are areas we have made progress. So for me, people get frustrated when they expect that one president is going to change this country. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Many countries that we call developed today, they had consistency of leadership and policy for a period of 16 to 20 years. And it doesn't mean just one president. You have a plan. You have a succession plan. And we're even talking of countries that are centrally controlled, not the federal structure like Nigeria, where the president will say, oh, I want children to be back to school, and the governor say, no, it's airport, that is my priority. I want to build airport. People don't have water to drink and say so. In centrally controlled economies like you had in Singapore and South Korea, which was ruled by the military, they enforced, they had the development agenda and enforced it. And they also had succession plan. We don't have that in Nigeria. So you have a president who has ruled for eight years, his party takes over from him and begins to reverse all his policies. Meanwhile, there is a plan. There is something called 2020. We will hit 10,000 megawatts by 20, 2007. By 2008, we hit 20,000 megawatts. We do this. And then someone comes and pulls it back. Mm. So it's also part of the problem. Development is a plan. It's a continuum. It's not something you come, you don't understand, and then you discard. So these are some of the things frustrating us, making us believe that Nigeria is not making progress. But we are making progress on certain aspects. Why, in some areas, I agree, we can do far, far better. Yes, but you do know, of course, that uh, there are a lot of other factors that go in in the assessment of a leader. Mm -hmm. It's not just whether you were able to do this, that, in terms yeah, of practice. It's exactly. also the, the level of communication you have with the people, the level of empathy, the sense that they get that this person actually cares about them and that if there is a crisis in the country, he's there at the heart of it. He may not be able to wave a magic wand and solve everything, but just that optics, the, the optics of being there, gives people a sense that, hey, this person cares about us, and that means a lot to people. Oh, very well. I agree with you. Mm. Um, George Bush, when he won his first election, he didn't even win, as far as we are concerned. Uh, the Florida votes, and uh, it was Supreme you mean George God W. Bush? W. Bush, yeah. not the father. Yeah. But when September 11 happened, that was the day he became president. Absolutely. Of I agree with you Went 100%. He was trying to talk, he was using the megaphone, trying to talk to the firemen and all the people there. And they, are saying, and they said, we can't hear you. He said, but I can hear you. The whole of America can hear you. We are going to go after the terrorists. We'll smoke them out. That was the moment he became president, in my own record. By the time he went for a second time, Absolutely, it was hands down. I, I agree. Now, in Nigeria, it's not something we've been lucky with. Leaders showing empathy. Mm. I remember when the cantonment bombs went off in 2001, I think, in Ikeja. A thousand people dead. A passenger was dead the following day. I was saying, I'm not supposed to be here. Shut up, this and that. But he went there physically, he, he said the wrong mm. things. Uh, when Jonathan was president and they were bombing up and down, anytime he released president, he said, oh, this man is always releasing president, he doesn't have, he can't, can't he, this country is too much for this guy to handle. He can't even stop this. So he has a template. He's just changing Damatru to Kano in the template. That's what the comments I was sharing people mm. make. Now, uh, the current president, who is so reserved, is not even showing up. And this has also caused people mm. to say, look, he's not showing empathy. But at the end of the day, these problems have to be addressed. At the end of the day, too, the president has to connect with the people that, oh, okay, when we had the problem, we was there. Mm. It, it, so people want that, actually. But for me, 
get rid of the terrorists, get rid of the bandits. Even if you are not going to show your face, I yes. just don't want to. I just don't. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to sleep with my eyes. Absolutely. I mean, I recall that in 2016, um, I drove from with, with a crew and my, a driver. You know, we we made we just did it without any security. We wanted to do it. We drove to Daura, where he comes from, in Katsina, and drove from Daura all the way to Calabar, stopping in every major town and doing a report from those towns. No security, nothing, absolutely safe along the way. I cannot imagine doing that today. <laughs> but what I was going to ask you is that, do you think that deep cynicism that you talked about yeah. Um, that people have is likely to lead to greater voter turnout and a desire to change the course of this country or is it likely to go the other way and deepen voter apathy in 2023? <laughs> well, um, let's start from somewhere. The votes, the figures we've been getting all along, I don't know how realistic those figures are. I believe that some of those figures are sexed up. Now, this election, I think is going to give us the, the base from which we know where, wha what is the real voter turnout. Because with the deployment of technology, now it's easier to capture the, uh, mm. the people who actually came out. Um, if you look at the 1983 elections, the Electoral Commission they said we had 62 million voters. Uh, 30, 40 years after 93 million, you mm. will know that something is wrong. 93 million is more realistic than the 62 million we're talking. So let's even know what the real turnout is before we can know whether there, there's going to be real turnout. But to answer the question specifically, mm. yeah, I think more people are b believing that this thing can bring about change. And I'm seeing more people, people that were not even interested in voting before saying they are going to vote. People are saying, if I saw one tweet last week, somebody said, because the budget deficit is too small, go and get your PVC. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean that budget deficit will go to reduce, uh, PVC will reduce budget deficit. But it's just a thinking now that, mm. oh, I want to bring about change. So the message should continue to be preached. Right. Get your PVC. Turn out to vote. Because there are also, I also see some young people who don't have, you just gather some young people, five, six, or how many of you have PVCs? And maybe only, only one person. And it's not so much about apathy, but I think people just like talking. We like talking in this country without the necessary action. B but to answer your question specifically, I believe that it will be it won't be able to compare previous figures with this year's figures because for now I think we are able to get rid of uh, those who didn't vote, who are yeah. get rid of those fake figures. But I still expect that there will be a turnout. The last turnout was about thirty something percent. I think it's getting, we are getting closer to the reality of turnout. You talked about people um, talking a lot yeah. in Nigeria <laughs> and, and not doing actually little. doing anything. Is yeah. that, you think that's got to do with this kind of sense of a magical continuity of, of things, like from the spiritual through to the <laughs> earth, and rather than actually hold <laughs> uh, the politician to account, we'll go to church or the mosque to pray. No, but let's also be honest. Uh, mm. Voter turnout issue is not limited to Nigeria. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a problem across the world when you look at the, this, those who are registered and those who turn out. Mm. I, I still don't know. I don't know if studies have I'm sure studies have been done along that line. But it's not purely in Nigeria. Well, uh, I agree. Uh, I th but I there are some countries that I make think it criminal for you not to vote. People, I don't know if we should. Yeah, well, Australia. Australia. Is one. <laughs> but I mean, uh, I, I think people generally mm. um, feel that they, they mistrust politicians. Yeah. So they just don't believe in them. It doesn't matter which country it, it is, because it's a big matter. issue in the UK <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. But we've seen the things happening in Brazil, um, talking about trust of politicians, yeah. happening in Brazil recently and before that, the US. Uh, with supporters of particular candidates refusing to accept the results of the elections and physically attacking the institutions of democracy. Nigeria, of course, also seen as a divided country at this moment with lots of public anger. Do you think Nigeria could get to that point, for example, in 2023? Um. I'm afraid, yes. 
um, it has happened before. Uh, we saw uh, riots wet here in the south, in the western region, 1964, 65. Um, in 1983, we saw riots in uh, Oyo State and uh, Ondo State. Um, in uh, 2011, riots in Bauchi, uh, Kaduna, Kano. So it's something that can happen in Nigeria. So, uh, um, however, I think the security agencies, uh, the politicians, the media, these are things we have to look into because the first thing is that you need a country to rule over. You need a peaceful country. If the tree is not comfortable, mm. the bird cannot perch on it. So it is in the interest of the bird for the tree to be comfortable and habitable. And habitable. Now, I am seeing certain trends that scare me about this 2023 election. Uh, I'm hearing people already talking about rigging. Oh, they want to manipulate the election. And there's yet no evidence to the best of my knowledge. But when people are saying those things, they are preparing grounds for a possible breakdown of law and order, uh, which I hope will not get, it will not, will not get there. Uh, there's also a process of seeking redress. Mm. If you think you have been cheated, either as a governorship candidate, uh, legislative uh, candidate, uh, that's a process. And we have seen the, the uh, tribunals, the courts, seen they've done their job. Governors have been removed in this country based on election results that uh, were believed to have been uh, uh, manipulated mm. or something like that. So, and then the politicians themselves, they have to pass the right message to their followers that no, let's do things the right way. Of course, above all, the election must be free and fair and must be seen to be free and fair. Now, in the context of that, what do you see as the real threat to this election that could lead to things crumbling? Is it the possibility that institutions such as INEC and those that enforce law and order might fail? Is it something else that could thrash this ballot and with it the hopes of Nigerians? Um, the, what I'm seeing is if people, if, voter, if uh, voters have been suppressed, if there is voter suppression, I think it can lead to uh, some crisis. So if I'm not allowed to vote, if thugs are unleashed on the stronghold of my supporters, mm. I think okay. there could be some resistance. And, uh, uh, um, a breakdown of law and order. That is a major challenge that I see. Uh, I also think that the utterances of the politicians. Uh, recently, one politician was saying somewhere in northern Nigeria, if you don't vote for this party, we will deal with you. I think these are dangerous utterances and irresponsible. People have been killed in the past because somebody called them vultures. Hmm. So those are the things that politicians must avoid. They say things, they do things because they are desperate, but you cannot set the country on fire. These are the same people who have their families in, in, safe, in safe places, as, uh, as it were. So they, they don't mind if the country catches fire. How many politicians have lost their children or wife? Or right. to, to, so they, we just have to be careful. We need a country. We need peace. I was in this, we were all in this country from 93 to 98. It's not the kind of country you want to live in. Where every day you are leaving your house, you don't even know uh, if you get to your office. Because suddenly we see people waving leaves. You have to be uh, turning and running back to your house. Police everywhere, soldiers shooting, killing. I don't think it's the kind of country we want mm. to live in. So let's just realize that no matter what, even if my candidate loses, we still need peace. For that woman who is selling tomatoes and mm. onions, to be able to put uh, where by the roadside and feed herself. Not that she can't eat, she, she's at home because there's crisis all over town. Yes, and um, we've got about a couple more minutes left before we have to end this really very interesting chat with you. But it is of course fair to say that every Nigerian will have their own personal feelings about which politician or candidate in the race will best serve Nigeria's interests. Do you have any particular candidate in your sights that you think might fit that bill of reinvigorating and refreshing this country? 
Yeah, very good, <laughs> very good question. Very, uh, but for me, I have my own view on this issue of who is the Messiah who is going to take Nigeria out of this problem. No one president is going to transform Nigeria. No one person. One, we run a federal system of government. The things that Nigerians complain about the most mm. are usually at the council level, state level. An uncle of mine visited me about 10 years ago and he was saying, I will not believe that Jonathan has performed until the road in front of my house is tired. And the road is a state government road. Mm. So there's this... Or a uh, local government local concern. Yeah. yeah. When we talk of primary education, when we say children are out of school, it's primary education we are talking about. It's not the councils. It's not under the federal government. When we talk of secondary education, there are 104, only 104 mm. schools under the federal government, uh, the unity schools. And we have probably 100,000 secondary schools in right. Nigeria. But just coming back to that point quickly, yeah. is there somebody you've got your sights on? That's what I'm saying, that no one person can solve the problem right. in this country. So uh, anyone well, who becomes well, president... Four, there are four front runners, and one of them will become president of Nigeria. Which do you think has the best chance of doing it? The best chance of, move, of making Nigeria a better place. Mm. Like I said, not one person can do it. <laughs> <laughs> not one person. <laughs> The, the, okay. the council chairman, well, uh, the uh, governors, the, everybody must work. So part of the problem is that we have so much, we have created messiahs right. in president. And after four years, we start abusing After three years, we start abusing them. Right. So I okay. don't believe any one of them is going to change Nigeria in the next Well, on that politically diplomatic <laughs> note, <laughs> I want to thank you, Simon Kolewole. Absolutely brilliant talking yeah. with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank indeed. you very much, sir.